Okay, so we've talked about kind of initial looks at the site and the initial idea of what the zoning and building codes are and our initial thinking about what our site strategies are for sustainability issues and things along those lines. Understanding the site itself and kind of uh, getting all that uh, together. Now we're at a spot where we're sort of saying, okay, in order to really dive from programming and uh, finalizing the programming and starting to move into schematic design, really to be able to make that leap from basic thoughts and ideas into actual designs, uh, now we have to sort of stop and put it all together. So instead of thinking about zoning as a separate issue, instead of thinking about sustainability issues as a separate issue, uh, instead of thinking about what the soils are like, what the site is like, what the uh, legal uh, concept here is like, we're going to think about them all together. How do we start to assemble this information in such a way that we are uh, using graphic and written tools in order to um, really get this to make sense logically as an overall site analysis. So we're going through this uh, as a project and starting to think of this not just as thoughts, as separate thoughts, but as an overall idea and how we're going to then use that to move forward with design. So for example, we talked earlier about the idea that there's some sort of graphic analysis for the different site options that you've got. So that's where we were talking about earlier, where you've got your building, you're starting to sort of understand where the orientation of the sun is. We're looking at those issues about uh, wind direction and what those issues might be. Is it important for us to, to worry about? Do we need to block it? Do we want to accept it? What are those kinds of issues? So we're doing, we have that graphic analysis that we talked about earlier so we can understand what those issues really are. But then there's a bunch of other issues we want to make sure we're starting to feed into this discussion. And one of them is the environmental reports. So we've talked about those in other sessions about being the environmental report of a phase one and a phase two. So the phase one is that sort of general description. That's where you go and check it out. You have a, a specialist who walks the site and they look at it and they see, and they do a little research and they make some recommendations. So you, they would look and sort of check it, but not do the testing, right? The testing is very expensive. And so you don't necessarily want to test everywhere because it'd just be over the top. So the phase one, the idea of that is that's that spot where you're going and just checking it out. Is this a, uh, seem like it's uh, a problem from an environmental standpoint, or does it actually look like it's really, uh, really not going to be an issue? There's not been a history of problems in the area or on the site, and and everything looks pretty good. They don't see anything. Well, if that's the case, then they don't need it a, a phase two uh, because it all looks good. But if they did look at it and said, "Well, that looks like asbestos," and there's a history of uh, tanks in the area and some problems here and some problems there. Well, then that would certainly uh, kick in the phase two, at which point you would come in with all the testing and all of that. And as I said, it's a much more expensive process. And so uh, you're always trying to not do that testing if you don't need it. But clearly, it's the only way to know if things are safe. So if you do need it, it's really important to do it. So the environmental reports, the legal description, which we usually think of as a survey, although it can actually be uh, quite more complicated than that, it could be a, a written narrative, it could be descriptive in numbers of ways, uh, especially when it comes to kind of condos that are within a larger structure. Uh, the condo report uh, acts like a survey, but in fact looks quite different and has a lot of it is, is in written form. Understanding the lay of the land, the topography, so that uh, we're not just thinking about it it from the standpoint of, uh, all right, let's think about topography all by itself, but now we're starting to think about it, how does it relate to uh, the zoning issues? How does it relate to the water runoff issues? How does it relate to uh, uh, all of these other um, kind of uh, the graphic analysis that we've been doing about where the sun angles are coming and the wind is coming? Uh, how does the topography of the land impact that kind of thinking? So you're bringing all of that stuff together and then the soils report. Now, the soils report sounds sort of odd, right? When you say that in this context, you think, really, we're going to look at the soils report? Like, soils report seems like such a detail element. Uh, like, why would we get into that level of detail when we're really talking about programming and, and schematic design, those kind of early phase uh, thinking? 
Well, the reason is because uh, that soil, uh, the, the specifics of that report can really dramatically impact uh, where you can build. Not that you can't, you can't build somewhere. It's this question is, can you build uh, efficiently and uh, cost efficiently uh, anywhere? So uh, we have a site, it's got maybe good soils in one location and pretty terrible soils in another location. Well, clearly I'm gonna want to build in the place that has the good soils, that has the high capacity uh, for uh, bearing the, the, the load that is this building that's going to be. Or if I build it in the place that has the, the not so good soils, well, that means I'm gonna spend a lot more money on my foundation. So uh, that system of uh, kind of understanding the relationship between uh, these sort of big design ideas that have to do with uh, all the sort of goals that we're setting in the programming and all that, well, it, it also comes down to these very specific issues of is that sand or is that silt or is that clay? It becomes those very sort of uh, tangible aspects of the soil. So quick reminder, a bunch of this information for example, the environmental reports, the legal surveys, the soils report, those are all things that are given to you by the owners, by the clients. Uh, when they sign the typical contract with you, that's something that they have to give you. They're giving you the site, they're giving you the information for the site, and it's important from a liability standpoint that that's in their wheelhouse. So they give those to you, each of these things, the environmental report, and the soils report, both of those uh, will come with recommendations. So it's not just data, it's actually data with then, here's our proposal of what we think you should do. Now, the environmental uh, specialists and the soils specialists, the geotechnical engineers, they don't know what building you're gonna design. They don't know, um, they don't even necessarily know what the occupancy of that building is gonna be. They don't know anything about it. All they know is from the soil standpoint or from the environmental standpoint. Uh, so when they give you recommendations, it's not recommendations as in, here's what the foundation should look like, done. It's more recommendations in the sense that this kind of soil in this sort of situation for typical kinds of loading, here's what would normally be done. And so you have a pretty good idea of kind of the normal situation. If your building, for whatever reason, doesn't fit to the normal situation, well, then you wouldn't follow the recommendations. But that would be a very big deal to not follow the recommendations of a geotechnical engineer or to not follow the recommendations of the environmental uh, engineers. Because what you're essentially doing is you're saying, yes, I see the recommendations, I acknowledge those recommendations, and then I'm going to ignore them or I'm going to dismiss them. Right? That's a pretty tricky thing to do. So uh, in general, this information is given to you by the owner. They've contracted for it themselves. You're not really even supposed to help them contract for it, and it's really their duty. And then they're gonna hand those reports to you, and then you're gonna create a whole series of these other documents, the graphic analysis for the site options, the thinking through from a sustainability standpoint, l using the, um, the uh, topography and trying to understand the lay of the land to to find you know the sort of opportunities in the land it's so all those things that you're going to be providing along with the information that they're providing and you're putting all of that together and analyzing it all and figuring out well what are the driving forces what are the issues that are going to make an impact on this particular situation so you could imagine uh, you have a question that comes at you that says, uh, here's a bunch of different pieces of information. Here's a, a geotechnical report. Here's a, um, a sort of our uh, program from a sustainability standpoint of what issues that we really want to uh, attack uh, for this project. Uh, here's a survey. Here's a couple of other pieces of information. And you might have to sort of scan through that information to find, wow, that uh, geotechnical report has uh, the area that I would have naturally assumed is would be where we'd build as being a really bad and expensive area to, uh, to build in. Maybe we have to put uh, caissons all the way down to bedrock or something. Uh, and so you would have to scan through and find that sort of outlier piece of information that then says, all right, so that's not where we're gonna build, we'll build in this other location. So you're looking for what are the driving forces that are gonna place our building, that are gonna give us all the sort of key pieces of information that we need in order to uh, sort of design the building that we want in an efficient and logical way. 
So let's take a look at a couple of these a little more closely.